thank you all so much for for joining and uh you know having a good time with us so far uh i've been having a great time this has been so much fun uh we're gonna be talking about some cool stuff today uh i will preface this where i got a couple chat windows open and i'm gonna be i got two displays so if you see me looking left and right it's it's not that i'm i'm looking all over i'm trying to bounce between what is chat what is slides um but with all that said, we're going to go over how to uh, bring your Angular web app uh, to native and uh, use a little project that uh, my team's been working on called Capacitor. Uh, my name's Mike Hardington, as it's been established. Uh, you can. All right, can we get a confirmation for audio? Good to go. All right, well, don't know what happened there, but we are going to go with headphones and hopefully that works well. Um, thank you all for letting me know that we lost audio. Uh, OK, yeah, like we said, uh, this will be recorded. So in the case that there is some audio issues, don't worry. We'll be able to replay this. Uh, I'll try to provide the slides and the app that we will be building afterwards. So more incentive to follow me on Twitter. Uh, and I will be going through the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so post your questions there. So starting off, we're going to be talking about this idea of cross-platform development. Uh, this isn't a new idea. This is something that's been around for quite a bit uh, and is actually the de facto way of building uh, video games. So if you ever have played uh, a modern video game, uh, chances are you are playing a game that's been built on something like Unreal Engine, Unity, um, bunch of proprietary cross-platform game engines. Um, really fun one that I like is if you've ever played the video game Metal Gear Solid, they built their own engine and they called it the Fox Engine, uh, which I think is just such a cool name. Uh, but these cross-platform engines are, are ways for you to go ahead and build something once, deploy to all of these different platforms that you want to target. Uh, mobile development has the similar approach, but for some reason, it's not necessarily the go-to uh, way for developing, uh, especially uh, for native. Now, the goals of cross-platform are fairly simple. Uh, reduce the amount of knowledge that you need to build something and deploy it to those various platforms. Uh, reduce the amount of code that you need to write and uh, maintain. Uh, especially important these days as code complexity uh, um, tends to uh, increase. We want to make sure that we're focusing on whatever it is that we need to do versus having to uh, worry about these uh, minute details. And then all in all, trying to figure out the best way to uh, reduce the amount of time needed to uh, deploy an app. Um, so all pretty simple goals. And I think cross-platform tends to do these really well. Now, when comparing cross-platform, we should probably think of these less as what is one being better than the other, and more on what level of an abstraction do they operate at. Pretty simple. If we were to think about a, uh, a scale where we have a pure web app on one end and then a pure native app on the other, where does where do our cross-platform solutions um, fall into this uh, spectrum? So with that in mind, let's kind of just do a quick little comparison of some cross-platform solutions that exist nowadays. Uh, one of the first ones that we'll look at is this one called Cordova. And you probably have heard of it as this, uh, the name PhoneGap before. Um, it is probably the first cross-platform uh, mobile app solution that has ever existed. I believe it was created uh, shortly 2008 after the first iPhone SDK was released. Uh, and they really have this goal of being a uh, polyfill for the browser and eventually to cease to need to exist. Uh, they wanted to disappear after the browser got good enough. Uh, where they added features like camera, file system, geolocation, based on uh, proposals and web standards. And they would implement them so that way when those standards finally shift, 
they could deprecate their plugins and their APIs and just use whatever the web promised. Uh, that didn't turn out the way that they intended, so they ended up having to exist for a longer while, but they got APIs like this, where they would create this camera object on the navigator, and it would have a method called get picture. It followed this format where it would have an on success callback, a non fail callback, and then a final um, uh, argument of how we want to configure this camera object or this instance of a camera. And we would be able to get some data uh, back from it in our on success callback and then a message whenever uh, something failed. What stood out to me about this approach is that it is very limiting uh, in terms of being cross-platform. Um, this API is only ever going to be available in an environment where Cordova exists. And eventually the API just never caught up to what the browser standards uh, ended up producing, which is the media device API. So we got in a situation where this API existed for a long time and it only existed in a Cordova realm where people were having to be forced to work uh, with these limitations. So the API was not as cross-platform as intended, um, and it had to create a lot of things that you know we take for granted for now, like it had to create its own pa uh, package manager. Um, it provided its own build scripts using, I think at the time, uh, various uh, make files, bash scripts, uh, long before NPM uh, hit the uh, uh, the main stage. So it was not as great as uh, it could have been, but for the time, it did a lot of great things. Uh, it tried to polyfill the web. Uh, it tried to hide away from the fact that we needed a native IDE, and it tried to make sure that we could just blow away our native uh, projects and only treat them as a disk target. So that way, when we did our build, we just got the IPA or the APK uh, as an output. Moving on to the other end of the spectrum, uh, something furthest away from the web and maybe one degree separation from pure native is this compile to native uh, idea. Now there's various projects here that could fall into the solution, so I'm not going to list them all, but we're going to look um, at one code example, which will be pretty obvious to what it is. Um, but their ideas were writing once for all these platforms doesn't work and it can never work because these platforms are so different. Instead, we should have an API that allows you to learn one approach and then have multiple code bases where you can swap in uh, per platform implementations as needed. So that's their approach and they promise this idea of a truly native app. Um, which doesn't actually, it's not actually the case. Um, and they probably actually did some really good things. Uh, their abstractions around native controls really meant that people were working with platform primitives. Um, abstracted as they are, they were still rendering uh, platform specific controls that folks would get uh, used to. And they provided a really nice standard library uh, around uh, core native APIs. So if you wanted to get access to the camera or create your live camera um, feed and in, in, uh, embed it inside of a view, you could do that. Their architecture was actually not too dissimilar from how uh, PhoneGap uh, operated, but what they had in a sense was that your web app would be run in some sort of runtime. Uh, this could be V8, this could be JavaScript core on iOS, or it could be its own custom renderer altogether where uh, everything is done, uh, done inside there. Then from that custom renderer or that custom engine, we're sending things out to this bridge layer, which would call in the appropriate uh, OS and hardware features, and then uh, serialize the data back. So this architecture is actually pretty similar between all platforms. Um, it's not too uh, uh, too unique to one or the other. Now, where this could break down is having to learn the different syntax and languages for each approach. Um, I don't know about everyone here, but when I am told this will be the best project ever, all you have to do is learn a brand new language and a brand new uh, 
uh, ecosystem and learn the quirks of that platform in that language, I'm already checked out. You've already lost me at having to learn yet another language. I just want to build something and ship it. If you have to go ahead and uh, incorporate some features that already exist in a web app, you're going to have to recreate them uh, for these compiled to native solutions. There is no web interop at the moment, um, and most likely there won't be because of how they're architected and how they're built. So I can't grab features that already uh, exist inside my web app, just drop them into my project because I'm writing probably some form of custom JavaScript that renders uh, Swift controls or some other language that renders uh, custom drawn controls. And then in the third party realm, there's very limited uh, libraries that are available to us. So if you're trying to look for, say, a Canvas uh, API or library, um, unless you're willing to use one that exists, unless you're willing to write one that uh, for those per platform implementations, you're probably out of luck. Uh, whereas the web has dozens of libraries out there that all do the same thing, uh, and you have choice galore. Um, so it's not all all it cracks up to be, and it's not all sunshine and rainbows in this compiled to native land. And this truly native bit to me is very, very peculiar. And it's a, it's a weird thing to uh, sell because you're not necessarily rendering something purely native. Um, in some implementations, you have a JavaScript uh, uh, VM that will interpret your JavaScript and call the correct native code to render your controls um, essentially on the fly. Which, sure, you could say, well, the controls are, are, are native, but most of your app logic is still operating in JavaScript. And in other implementations where you have a fully custom renderer and a fully custom language, they're not using the controls that are per platform. They're creating their own controls and just essentially drawing them on the screen um, when they are needed. So this idea of something being truly native is, I think, a terrible thing to kind of highlight. Um, it doesn't really mean anything, especially to me. Uh, and it shouldn't really mean anything to you, because what is really native these days? Um, it's kind of a, a, a moot argument to really have. So we kind of discovered, you know, talked about one degree separation from the web, one degree separation from purely native. What happens is we right in the middle in this case. Uh, that is this project called Capacitor. Now, Capacitor is a great project that uh, we've created at Ionic, but it is not tied to anything that uh, we do. It's framework agnostic, it's library agnostic, uh, it's a truly just uh, pure uh, uh, JavaScript library that you can use in any app. So it exists in two parts, where we have this native runtime that you can use to embed a web app inside of a native control or inside of a native uh, uh, application. Now, to make uh, to just do that would be very limiting. Uh, it might not actually be approved by certain app stores. Uh, so we have an API that allows you to bridge that web app and that native uh, wrapper uh, and call native features. So you could call geolocation, you could call the file system, uh, Bluetooth, what have you. Uh, anything that's available through native can be exposed to your web app. The API itself is actually a, uh, provides a different implementation per platform. So you're going to get one that exists uh, um, uh, specifically for the web, one that'll exist specifically for iOS, and one that'll exist specifically for Android. But you as a developer are only ever interacting with essentially a facade. Your API is uh, an API, your API that you inter interface with is going to just call the correct behind the scene implementation. And all you ever do is call, you know, something high level that knows here are the options, handle the data however you need to. And for the tooling side, uh, we're making use of the native tooling that comes with each platform. 
This means on iOS, we're using things like CocoaPods, uh, and on Android, we're using uh, Android's uh, libraries features, which are all uh, pretty awesome. So altogether, this kind of already feels like it's pulling in the best of both worlds. We're getting uh, pretty custom, uh, we're getting pretty standard native tooling, but also pretty familiar web developer environments. Um, so I really like how that feels. Architecturally, uh, this is very similar to that compile to native solution, where in blue, we have this web app that we are going to render. And then we have this native uh, wrapper that exists and uh, presents the web app to our users. From here, we have a bridge layer that will interpret uh, calls from that native wrapper and then send those out to the appropriate uh, system features. So it'll call uh, any OS level features like getting the battery status, or it'll call hardware features like presenting the camera or interacting with Bluetooth. Once those calls have been made, they'll serialize the results, pass it back into the wrapper, and then send that along to your web app to consume in the form of a promise. So this is a fairly fairly straightforward architecture. Um, how is this different from other solutions? Well, first and foremost, it basically lets you be able to take your existing web app and just load it up in a uh, into a native uh, context. Really great. Uh, the runtime and APIs are available instantly. So if you need to go ahead and have some like very fast system calls or you want to initialize native uh, crash analytics, you can do that in the native code and it's going to instantly be available. And if for some reason you uh, are updating to a new version of uh, your native IDEs and your native tool chains, because we're utilizing native best practices, the migration between uh, major versions there are going to be fairly uh, simple. You just go in, open up your native IDEs, perform the updates that are needed, and you're good. So all that together, let's actually switch over to uh, our, our code editor and actually look at an app. So I have a small little Angular app here, nothing, nothing too uh, drastic. Uh, it is using um, standalone components, so uh, don't worry if you don't uh, know what standalone components are or how to use them yet. You'll find out all about them at ng-conf uh, and some upcoming versions of Angular. But essentially, it's a module uh, list uh, approach to using Angular. So I'm just going to run my dev server, let this get up and running. And then I will open it up here in my browser and 4200. And you can see we're just using a blank Angular app. Uh, there's nothing fancy here. There's no UI library. Um, I would assume that most folks have a library, UI library of choice. Uh, obviously, I think Ionic's a really great UI library, but there's also Angular Material, Tailwind, uh, if you want to run your, your own custom one or probably use something different in your own custom solution. Um, what's the other one? Tiga, Tiga I think, or Taiga uh, for your own, uh, for another UI library of choice. Uh, you can check that out. Whatever UI library that you're using, uh, it doesn't really matter. You should just be using one. Uh, and here inside of our app, we just have whatever Angular provides as the standard um, uh, widget of choice. So we're not going to focus too much on building out UI and having these features. What we are going to focus on is how to actually call native features and then deploy this app to uh, a mobile device. So I had mentioned it earlier during the slides and we're going to incorporate uh, geolocation. Uh, I think geolocation is a great example here because it touches on several features that are unique to uh, uh, to the native platforms that don't exist inside of the web. So we're going to install at uh, capacitor and we're going to install the geolocation plugin. Uh, getting ahead of myself, but before we do that, we need to install capacitor itself into the project. So capacitor exists as two parts. Um, 
it exists as a core library that we have, and then this very, very slim CLI that we can incorporate for uh, access, uh, for performing runs and builds of our app. So we're going to install these real quick. Let NPM do its thing. And if I spell seal uh, capacitor correct, well, <laughs> let's install core first. And then we'll install CLI. All right, so that is available. Now with those packages installed, we can then run this capacitor command, uh, which will init a new project. Uh, we'll run mpx cap init. Now capac cap is just a shorthand. Uh, as you can see, spelling capacitor can be a challenge, um, even for me as a person who has to write the name every single day. Uh, so the shorthand is very uh, welcome. And then we get presented with this prompt, which essentially is going to set, walk us through the setup process. So we get asked to pick a name for our app, which will be displayed to the users. In this case, I'm just gonna stick with what the default is, which it pulls from your package JSON. So we're gonna say ng webinar is the name, and then we're going to pick the package ID. Now package ID is essentially just a way for our apps to have a unique ID in the app store. Uh, in this case, we're going to keep it com.example.app, but if you're building stuff for your company, it's normally a reverse domain. So from, for Ionic, it's more or less gonna be io.ionic slash uh, dot whatever. Um, so keep that in mind when you go ahead and uh, create this stuff. Now from here, once this is done, we get a config file uh, created for us, and then we get presented with this where to go next for our uh, link to the docs. Uh, we're not going to use that because we don't need that. Uh, you have me. And then we're going to install our geolocation plugin. Now the geolocation plugin is split out into its own thing as well as all of the core APIs that Capacitor provides. So that way you do not get uh, things included into your uh, app that you aren't using. Um, for instance, if you include the camera plugin, but you don't ever call the camera, uh, Apple tends to look uh, down on that and will say, hey, if you're not gonna use a camera, don't include the code for it. So things you keep in mind. We have a very, very um, fine-grained control over what features get added. Now we're gonna close that and have our app still running and we'll just resize uh, the window. And we're going to come over to our main app component. Now, inside of this app component, we're going to go ahead, as soon as I finish that, editor settings, as soon as we're in here, we're going to create this on init callback. Now, on init is just going to fire whenever the app component has been created. And we're going to use this to create a, our first little bit of native code. So let's go ahead and import at the top of our pro uh, project from capacitor uh, geolocation. We're going to import the geolocation class. Now this class is going to go ahead and just uh, give us access to all of the geolocation APIs. And inside of our RNA net, we'll just say um, geolocation dot request permission. So fairly simple. And this will go ahead and prompt the users like, hey, can we get uh, location data? So let's save. And then we're going to open up our uh, browser and just make sure that this is all good. Uh, just to be sure, I'm going to restart my server because sometimes the uh, dev server doesn't pick up when you've installed new packages uh, in the background. So let's do some quick window management bring this down here and here we go and we can also check the ah it is a promise so what we're doing is getting stuck inside of the promise not getting resolved let's await this 
So this is still not firing, and that's for a very good reason. Geolocation permissions on the browser are not really, they're not that great. Um, your browser has to get uh, location data basically, or get permission to do this as soon as you call that data. So let's go ahead and add that. So we'll create a new method called get location, and it's going to be an async method because every method inside a capacitor is asynchronous. And we're going to say const, uh, and I know this is going to get destructured later on, where we're going to say there's going to be a chords uh, variable later on. And we'll say await geolocation dot uh, get current position. We can simply do that and everything should be available. Check out what we have here. So this coordinates uh, variable that we have is going to be an object. And we're going to get things like the latitude, longitude, accuracy. And then we get a few other uh, pieces of information here. Uh, we have altitude accuracy, which could be a number, could be null, could be undefined. Altitude, uh, speed, heading, all these could be null or just not provided. Now, this is because each platform has their own quirks with what kind of data they provide. So I could be in the web and I'm not going to get the heading, the speed, uh, the altitude, because the location data just does not provide that. But I could be on iOS or I could be on Android and I can get all that data. Um, so this way we can safely uh, access features as they are uh, provided and essentially enhance the app uh, the more closer to native that we get. So with those features, what we're going to do is we're going to set that onto a, uh, uh, a local variable here. So we'll say uh, private, or actually, no, we need to make this public. We will say uh, location data, and we'll just set that to null for now. Uh, we'll, we'll just ignore it for now. We won't provide any type uh, information except for any. Um, don't ever do this. Do, do the right thing. Provide a type, uh, provide type information. Back inside of our, geo, our get location method, once we have all this, we could say this dot location data is going to be an object. We're going to have a longitude. And that is going to be set to coords dot longitude when your editor doesn't mess up typing for you. And then we'll also have latitude, which is going to be chords.latitude. Now, all that together is going to uh, work for us. Now, inside of our app component, let's get rid, uh, well, we'll keep the content, but we're gonna get rid of most of this stuff, uh, specifically the cards. And we're going to create a pair, uh, free tag, and then we will say uh, location data and just pass that through some JSON uh, pipes. And then we will go ahead and create our button and attach a click handler here. So the click handler is going to say get location. Uh, where in the world am I? And just to make sure that we are doing things correctly, we're actually going to use a nice little feature uh, that our browser has available. So the browser is going to let me set the location to be Mountain View. And I could hi uh, hard code that to be these values, or it could be anything, or I could even override that to say, hey, location data for some reason isn't available. Uh, so just making sure that I have that set up so that way I'm not uh, giving out my real location and let's go ahead just scroll that down and then we will save this file so where in the world am i okay now we get a nice little permission uh, uh prompt over here localhost 4200 wants to know your location we will allow it and then we will go ahead and try to get that again for some reason the ah data has been returned so this is already getting the location data. Under the hood, what we're actually doing is running um, uh, uh, navigator 
get current location or navigator.geolocation.get current location. So if we're using this and this is something that is built into uh, the browser, why are we providing a plugin or an API? Can't we just use whatever geolocation provides? No. Because of these permission models, we need to have a per platform implementation. And this becomes a lot more clear when we think about how the um, when we think about the native projects. So let's go ahead and initialize these native projects. I'm going to set this up. What we'll do is we will run npm install at capacitor, and then I'm going to install iOS. Um, I've tried to do Android Live, uh, and Android Studio tends to take forever. Uh, cap add iOS. Once our project has been created, we're going to go ahead set the uh, mpx cap add command, which is going to go ahead and maintain all of the uh, project creation for us. So it'll go ahead, you'll see we got a warning. It couldn't run the sync command, meaning that we haven't built our web project yet, but it'll add the iOS platform and uh, give us a link to some docs for uh, what our workflow should be like. So let's do a quick little build here. It'll go ahead and run our build. And you can see I'm using uh, ES build here because I am uh, I'm one for trying things that are experimental. And then we'll come back up to our editor and we're going to quickly configure things to work uh, correctly and that we're pulling the right source code. So we have this set to dist and then ng webinar. Let's go ahead and set the web dir to be ng webinar. Make sure that we're just pulling the right source code. So for instance, if you are setting up a project inside, say, a mono repo, you could have multiple things getting built to disk, uh, but you're only ever including one project into the native configuration. This is just something that you're going to want to make sure you have set up correctly. Um, I didn't do it manually, so I'm just editing this now. Now, once that is done, you can see we have this iOS folder created. And it's creating the workspace, the app for us. It creates a pod file, which is iOS's version of essentially a package JSON. Uh, nothing really too drastic. So let's go ahead and we can actually quit out of the editor. Um, once we have that done, let's run npx cap sync. And we're going to sync the iOS uh, project. Now sync will go ahead and copy all of our web assets but then it's running this pod install uh, command. Now, because this is using pod install, it's fetching all the native dependencies needed for our iOS project. And it takes, you know, a few seconds, and then we can run npx cap open iOS. This will go ahead, open up the iOS workspace for us. It'll be fairly uh, quick. And then we're going to go ahead and just tweak a few different settings. Because of how iOS works, we need to be explicit about what kind of features we're requesting from our app. So we're gonna to come to this little file tree. We'll say, go to the app, open up this info.plist, and we're going to add a new row. And then we're going to say location, uh, if I can, location when, when in use, is that going to give me what I need? And it won't give me what I need, I think, maybe. Come on. All right, so it's not giving me the location stuff that I need, potentially. Oh, well, it's in the privacy, so here we go. So you can see iOS has a lot of permissions, um, which is great. Uh, but they can be uh, a little confusing. So we're going to pick the location always and when in use feature. And this is essentially going to tell the user, hey, we want to get your location. And then we have to provide a value for telling the user why we need this location. Uh, I would like to know where you are. Uh, we're going to try to be uh, pretty explicit. Provide a good message if you're doing this yourself. Uh, be very clear. 
you probably have seen apps that request these permissions and have either provided good messages or bad messages. You would probably want to provide a good message. I'm not going to assume that you would want to provide a bad message because I don't know you. With that in place, we can then go ahead and run our app. And all that's going to be is hitting this little play button. Now, the design has changed a little bit, but I used to say that Xcode is essentially iTunes, but for iOS developers. So this is not that confusing of an app. Um, it can be a little cumbersome, but pretty simple to see, okay, here's the app, here are the targets that I can deploy to. Play is going to be my build. And we're going to let that run real quick to see if we have our simulator up and running. So I'm going to give it a second to go ahead and uh, boot up. Um, if you've never done any iOS development before, uh, iPhone is notorious for being uh, fairly slow. And you can see we have a warning here. So typically, when this app starts up, we would have gotten a permission uh, dialog to say, hey, can we know where your location is? But we didn't. And Capacitor will be smart enough to know why. So we can say geolocation request permission. This, this app has attempted, attempted to access privacy sensitive data. What do we do? We just have to provide this new key. So let's go back over to our info.p list. Uh, we're going to add another row. We'll just paste that in there and just say, uh, I would really like to know where you are. And then we can do a quick little build again. Allow ng webinar to use your location. We can provide precise, allow once. We're going to allow it once and let that uh, uh, basically provide the course location granted and then location data granted. So this will be our actual return value from request. Once we're in here, let's go ahead and click the buttons and you can see up in the top, we get the little uh, location indicator saying that we are grabbing your location and then we get the actual data back from our call. So all of this is working really well. Now, why are we using a plugin in this case when we could be using navigator.geolocation? This is technically a web view right here. Like if we open up our dev tools, we can see uh, that this app is able to inspect everything going on here. So we can see we get the body, the app route, all of our components. Uh, why are we still using a plugin? Well, because if we were to try to call this from um, this setup right inside of our JavaScript code, we actually get double prompted. Uh, we'll get a prompt from the JavaScript using navigator.geolocation saying, hey, index.html would like to get your uh, location. And then we'll get another prompt from the app saying, hey, this app would like to get your location. So we get a double prompt, not necessarily the best experience, uh, and then we also miss out on all of that location data. So let's actually look at our app component again. And instead of just picking out all of the data like we have here, let's just spread out everything inside of coordinates and see what we get between the two platforms. So I'm gonna do a quick little build again should only take a few seconds this time. Thank you, Angular, and your caching mechanism. And then npx cap sync iOS. And then we will run inside of our app. Let this do its thing, and then instead, I'm just going to run start in this browser and let this uh, kick back up again. So again, we get our prompt, allow once, and then said, let's get all that location, location data. And then we'll just do some quick little window management. You can see our location should be prompted. 
if we were to actually go ahead and get this up and running, that'd be great. What is the error here? Is there an error? Uh, defaults. Not implemented on the web. Okay, that is the uh, that is the other location data. Uh, I don't know why it's not showing up here. Component.html, but you can see inside of iOS, we are getting all of our data that we would want to get um, and could build out a pretty great uh, UI here. So we could be building something like a location uh, tracking for, you know, maybe if you have children that you would like to know where they are based on uh, phone to something like a delivery service where you want to tell the users, hey, your driver is here. Here's our location, and you can build out the mapping uh, features for this as well. So all that location data is being ref uh, returned and is a fine detailed location. What's probably uh, more interesting in this regard is how we could do this and then have access to things like tracking location. Uh, it's something that people have always wanted to do for some reason. So let's say async track location. Uh, and we're going to call track location. And we're going to also create this private uh, location tracker. Now, location tracker is uh, going to be a string. And we're going to say this.location tracker is going to equal uh, geolocation dot watch position. Now, it returns a bunch of different stuff. We have a set of options that we could pass if we wanted to. I'm just going to pass an empty object. And then we get a callback. So we could get uh, the location. Now we'll say location data. And then we could get, or actually, no, let's go ahead and just say coords because I know it's going to be there. And then if we have an error, we'll handle that however we want. And then inside of that callback, we'll just say, rinse and repeat, this dot location is going to be uh, the coordinates. And then this location tracker, I forgot to add the await. Uh, this location tracker needs to be cleaned up because it'll run indefinitely. So in our ng on destroy, we'll just say this dot, uh, we'll say actually a sync, I believe, we'll say geolocation dot, if I could spell it right, geolocation dot clear watch. And we're going to give it the ID of this dot location tracker. So here's how the whole flow works, just to be sure. We're going to call track location. That is going to kick off a uh, native location service, which will watch the position and return that data whenever we get new data. But that watch is going to return a new ID for the, uh, uh, the watcher itself. Now, when our component gets destroyed, we're going to want to clear that watch. Otherwise, we would just be getting data from the lo native location service, even if we don't need it. So in a more complex app, we're probably not going to have something as simple as this, but we could be embedding this in, say, uh, a, a native app instance or an app instance where we're changing views. We're not going to want to have that running in the background when we go from slash maps to slash about or slash order. So we need to have some way to control that and pause it or stop it whenever it's in the background. So with this setup, let's go ahead and try to figure out how to get this on our uh, on our computer. Uh, Let's figure out why this is also yeah. It's a promise of a string, right? Uh, there we go. Add undefined. Thank you, TypeScript, and your auto completion for telling me how to solve this. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, I will tell you that that is going to exist. 
actually we'll, we'll we'll be smart we won't try to be clever uh we'll just say lock and lock.chords i can guarantee you those uh coordinates are going to be there because i am i'm smart actually don't need it to be a promise of a string we just need it to be a string i will unfurl the promise afterwards Okay, everything is good. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try this. Uh, actually, we forgot to, instead of get location, we'll call track location. So let's go ahead and get this running. Now, we could go ahead and try to uh, run this uh, on the device and do a constant build, but that's kind of boring. Let's go ahead and actually try to get this up and running um, using a uh, library load. So I have this going with localhost 42. And if I recall, we can set this inside of our capacitor.config. Now this has a feature where we can say the server provides us or the well we'll actually see what we need uh did they get rid of it okay so it might have got been removed so we're going to actually skip that altogether apologies i was mistaken uh so instead of doing the serve we're just going to do our build again and we're going to sync this over uh there has been a feature, I could be mistaken, where you could deploy it to your iOS device and have it do a live reload. Instead, we're just going to do a sync and we're going to let this location data get moved over to iOS. So sync has succeeded. Let's go over to our app and we're going to start up our app again. Great, we'll get our prompt, allow once, location granted, and then let's go ahead and track the location. You can see we're already getting logs printed to our app. So this is already, uh, already going really, really well. Now, what we can do even better is inside of the app, we could say our location is going to be constant. And let's just delete all the log information is that way we're not spamming it. But you can see that location isn't changing. Uh, we're staying at the same place constantly. If we were to go ahead and open up our simulator, we can actually change that to be a freeway drive. So location tracking as people are on the move or inside your app or as any uh, app is moving, this can all be mapped back to say something like Google Maps or uh, open layers, and you could build out the mapping features with a fairly few lines of code, um, which is really great. So we are coming up to that time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So I'll wrap up here uh, and kind of go over what we talked about. So first off, if we want to add this to an existing project, uh, first I would suggest try this out. Uh, create a new Git repository, create a new branch, and install the core uh, package, and then install the core CLI and run cap init. It'll go ahead, it'll enhance your web app, even if you're not using uh, native features or planning to deploy to native, this could still be beneficial to you. If you're curious about trying uh, other features, or learning more about what Capacitor can do, you can go to capacitorjs.com. It, uh, it'll show you how to get started, what projects, uh, what a project structure should look like, how the workflow should behave, and then our docs, which will give you a more in-depth guide about how uh, to work with the APIs, how to uh, call different plugins, what's available for the core API, etc. If you want to try some other features that maybe aren't uh, weren't suited for core, but uh, are definitely great features. Uh, there is a capacitor community where they have extended the plugin ecosystem to include things like Stripe payments, uh, Firebase Cloud messaging, uh, Facebook login and authentication, SQLite databases even, uh, a lot of great things in there. 
um, pretty happy that we have that community org. Um, and know that this is stuff that is being used not just by uh, hackers and indie startups. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, logos that we can you know throw out here, but I think some really cool ones are uh, the uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, BBC are all using are using Capacitor. Uh, we've gotten their permission to use this, but you're in good company. Uh, this stuff isn't going away, and it's being used by large uh, enterprises as a a uh, great way to build their app. So uh, try it out. These folks have, and they're pretty happy. Uh, you could be happy too. Just quick little parting thoughts. Uh, Cross-platform here, in this case, we're just reducing the amount of code that we have to write. To create a location tracker, we had to create, write uh, maybe five lines of code. Fantastic. I don't have to maintain the location services in the background. I know what I need to maintain. If I want to have full at native access to say our Swift code or to our Java code, I can do that too. I opened up Xcode and I had access to modify our uh, location data or our info P list by just opening it. It's not a scary, scary thing. Uh, the native projects are pretty uh, simple to deal with these days. Uh, the web app is just the part that we want to write in. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm, Love to go to questions now uh, if you have any. Uh, again, you can find me on Twitter, uh, M. Hardington. And if you're going to be at NGConf, um, I look forward to seeing you. It's going to be a great time. All right. Uh, we have some questions coming in, in here. Uh, Addy wants to know is this WebStorm or a cool theme on VS Code? This is actually uh, Vim um, because I am an Uber nerd. But if you would like to do code the way that Mike codes, uh, I have a theme on VS Code called Oceanic Next. Uh, look for the one written by Mike Hardington. Uh, it is the same color theme, just ported over. Uh, I've answered that. An anonymous attendee would like to know that they develop on a Windows box. Uh, would it be possible to Get back here. Uh, would it be possible to do this, or would you need a Mac to build for the iOS version? So, short answer is that you would probably need a Mac at some point. Uh, but if you are a Windows developer, we have a solution out there. It's a, it's a paid solution, so uh, take that for what it's worth. But it allows you to do the remote builds uh, for iOS without ever having to uh, use a Mac. So it could be something worth checking out. Uh, again, it's a paid additional service. It's not free. Um, so there are open source alternatives that you could use, but um, uh, take it, uh, take that how you will. Um, uh, Satish, uh, we're using IETN for localization. Uh, would it be, uh, what should, be the webder in capacitor config in this case, as there will be multiple sources. Okay, great question. Uh, so if you're building an app with uh, localized data, which uh, is really great on you, uh, we actually have another project called trapeze.dev, which haven't fully announced it yet, uh, but it is essentially a way for you to configure your project um, for a different platform, for a different uh, IAT and N build. So if you're doing something for uh, app slash EN for the English version, and then you have Spanish version and the Portuguese version, what have you, you can go ahead and you can configure all that um, here inside of uh, using this tool called Trapeze. And I'm going to uh, don't go check it out right now. Know that it is possible because we're still building out this. It's a, you're getting an, an early look at it, um, but soon I promise it'll be it'll be available. Um, Victor is asking: Is Capacitor the new Ionic? Capacitor has been created by Ionic. Uh, best way to think of it is that Capacitor is our uh, solution to. Uh, the cross-platform runtime. Ionic is still uh, viable uh, for the UI layer. We are just, we swapped out what was Cordova for Capacitor at this point. So it's 
not the new Ionic, but it is the new engine that uh, Ionic uses. Uh, Victor, can I watch the recording from the beginning? Yes, the recording will be made available afterwards, Victor, so you'll be able to catch the very, very beginning. And then Addy, uh, if you're using capacitor for PWA, we probably still create a different layer for native. Great question. Uh, if you're only doing a progressive web app and you're not intending to deploy to the iOS or Android app store, you can simply just run your build uh, as you would normally be doing and then deploy that disk target. Uh, the capacitor code that you will be including is nothing more than, um, actually, let's take a look at it. The capacitor code that will be included in there is fairly uh, simple. It's just going to include the uh, geolocation API in this case for our app. So it's not going to be uh, uh, bloating your project. Um, for some of the APIs, we have things like, um, what's it called, uh, camera, which have their own web implementation. So you could be doing stuff like that. Uh, but if you're just targeting PWA, uh, you, you wouldn't create a native uh, project like iOS or Android project. You'd still just be deploying uh, what is used uh, in your disk target. And I think that's all the questions. Uh, looks like it. So uh, thank you all so much for joining. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, we will, hopefully I'll be able to see you all at NGConf if you are intending. If not, feel free to reach out to me again, uh, M. Hardington on Twitter. Uh, have a great day.